Thank you for joining us this morning for our Sunday service. We're glad you are with us whatever time you're watching this, whether it be uh, right after lunch or it be later tonight or even um, this week. We're thankful that you are joining us here at Kingsville Baptist with this recorded service. Just a few announcements to start us off. The first one is this. After today's service, we will have our deacon election. And what that's going to look like is this, is that when the service is over and we send out the email for this service, attached to this email will be the link that you can click on that will take you to the ballot for deacon elections. And so you just click on that link. It will take you to the ballot. You very quickly fill it out. It's only two questions, so it won't take you, it won't take you long. So just fill that out. And then once you, once you click submit on that, you will be done. Um, with that. If you are not able to um, click on that link, then you can come here and, and, and vote here. Donna will be here from, from 1 to 3. From 1 to 3, she'll be here. The church will be open from 1 to 3 for you to come and vote here. So Deacon Elections today. Make sure that you complete that link. If you, if you do it through the link, make sure you complete that before 9 o'clock tonight. That's when, that's when the voting will close. It will be 9 o'clock tonight. Um, Tomorrow, I'll go live for our Monday message at noon, at noon on Facebook, um, and then I'll go live again on Wednesday for our Wednesday Word as we are going through the meta-narrative series that we're going through on Wednesdays at noon. We'll also have our adult Zoom Bible study Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. You can check your email, and you can find the link for that Bible study in your email on Wednesday. Also, it's important for us to note that on August 30th is Children's Day, which will be right here in, the, in our sanctuary. We'll be gathering again on August 30th. So please, um, if you feel comfortable, we would love for you to be a part of that service here on our campus on August 30th. We'll be gathering again for Children's Day. Also, lastly, this, that um, tomorrow on August 17th, the budget request will go out to the committee chairs. And so make sure that you are... Um, filling those out and turning those back in by September 21st. So uh, August 17th, budget request forms go out. Okay? Yes, Donna? Yes. Yeah, so it's, I want to give you an update on this, and this is a good transition into our uh, invocation. But Bob Swain is home. He, he was taken to the emergency room um, last night. They gave him some fluids, but they sent him home. So be praying for Bob and Miss Rose um, during this season. Okay? Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll get into our service, all right? Lord, we love you, and we're thankful, Lord, for just who you are. And we're thankful, Lord, for this day that we get to gather in this way. Lord, this is not uh, what you intended, but, Lord, this is the way that you have made for us to, to gather as a body today. And so we're thankful for it. And, Lord, we're thankful most of all for your son, Jesus, and the life that he lived and the death that he died, and that he is no longer dead, but he is living and that he is going to come back for us. Lord, we're thankful for that truth. Lord, we're also um, today, Lord, as we've already mentioned, uh, Mr. Bob, we just pray for him and Miss Rose right now um, during the season with him, Lord, and just pray that you would bring comfort and peace to him and Miss Rose. We also pray for Lake and Boone, who had, um, who had some dental surgery this week. Just pray that you would help her in recovery. Also, Chris Johnson, who had cataract surgery and also we just remember all of our teachers and students lord right now who are returning back to school um, either last week or this week as, as they are adjusting to this new um this new world in education we'll just pray for wisdom and strength and just lord give them the give them the what they need in order just to, to do this new this new world that we we're in right now lord just give them strength we also just pray for our leadership right now, right here in Kingsville in our local government and in our county, but also at the state level with our governor and, and all the different things going on there. And also, Lord, we pray for our, for, our, for our president and everything that's happening at the national level. Lord, we just pray for leadership. We pray that your wisdom would be among them and you would lead and guide them. Lord, we also pray for leadership within our churches. Um, Lord, we pray for our leadership here, um, that you would give us wisdom and you would lead and guide us and direct our steps, but not also our church, but Lord, also all the churches that are in this area and in this county, but Lord, the church in general, Lord, your church, we pray for wisdom. We pray that the church of Christ will be marked by the wisdom of God right now during this season. And Lord, we also just pray for today's service. We pray, Lord, that you would move in a mighty way, that your Holy Spirit would just change hearts and change actions, and that we would not just be hearers of your word, but we'll be doers also. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Today I'll be reading Ecclesiastes 2 verses 9 through 11. These words are written by King Solomon David's son. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, in all this my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Let us pray. Dear God, I pray that you will minister to us right now. Bring us to that place of total dedication to yourself where we can find peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we're thankful, Lord, for who you are. We're thankful, Lord, for this day. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for just how you continue to take care of us and how you continue to 
to show us grace and mercy. And Lord, I just pray today as we hear your word read and proclaim that you would move in our hearts and that you would change us. And Lord, as we prayed earlier, make us not just hearers, but doers also. We need your help. I need your help, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Um, if you've been with us, we are in the middle of our of a series called A Faith That Works, and we are walking through the book of James. We're walking through it verse by verse. Um, this week, we are going to be in James chapter 4, and we're going to go all the way to, ver- to chapter 5, verse 6. We're going to cover quite a bit of scripture today. Um, and if you notice, we're, we're skipping 3, 13 through 18, but... Um, if you remember when we first, one of my first few Sundays here, I preached on that passage and I walked through that verse by verse. So if you want to hear that again, you can look back at our YouTube page and you can find that sermon. But we're going to skip it today because I just recently spoke on that passage. But last week we looked at James's warning about our tongue and we said that our words carry weight and that our words are important and that they need to be respected. Um, and we need to be careful in how that we use our words and Beyond that, we said that our main point was this, is that our words reveal the condition of our hearts, and that James is calling us to live out the faith that saved us, like we've been saying almost every week, and that our words should communicate something. They should communicate kindness, respect, and they, can, they should communicate the gospel. We know someone is a believer based on what they say and what they do. This week, we look at James's warning against worldliness. You may against worldliness and so as I said we have a lot of scripture to cover so we're going to jump right into it this week and it's important to know this going into this passage this is going to be James's most harsh language that he uses he uses a lot of very strong language in this passage we're going to see a a tone change in James in chapter 4 through verse 6 but I believe that tone change is for a reason because he's stressing a very important point here toward the end of this letter so let's first look at chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 And it says this, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot attain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that Scripture says he earns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? So in these first five verses, we see that James is um, confronting the, the problems of conflict that are happening within the people that he's addressed this letter to. And he's saying that the reason that this conflict is there is because conflict is is their conflict is deriving because each person is after their own desires and that the desires are from the passions of this world and they're not seeking after God, not seeking after what God wants. In fact, they're even asking God for the passions of this world, that the things that they're asking that they're not receiving, they're not receiving because they're asking for the wrong things. James here uses very strong language to describe how they are acting and even to the point calls them enemies of God. And But he's doing this and he's making the point that they are acting in worldliness and that God is jealous of them because of it. James says that, as we've said, all conflict derives from their worldly desires. And he uses the word in verse 4. If you go back and look at that, he starts verse 4 by saying this, You adulterous people. We see very clearly that prior to this Prior to this verse, that when he referred to the people he was writing to, he would call them brothers, or he would use the Greek word that would meant for brothers and sisters. He referred to them as um, family. But here, he calls them adulterous people. We see that in this letter, at this point, that the tone of the letter has changed, that he's now addressing something that he thinks is very serious, and he calls them adulterers. He's equating what they're doing as someone who is having an affair in their marriage. That's what he's equating it to. And James is not the first p- person to do this in the Bible. In fact, if we were to read in the Old Testament, specifically the Old Testament prophets, we see that they use this same language as well. Quickly, I'll read Isaiah 54, 5 and 6. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. And the God of the whole earth he is called. 
Verse 6, For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. We see very clearly in Isaiah that God is referred, or that we are referred to as God's wife, or the people of Israel refer to God's wife, and God is the husband. Being a believer means that we are part of the church of Christ, which is often referred to as the bride of Christ in the Bible. Often that, that example is being made. And so when we turn our back, to, when we turn back to our old life, we are then cheating on Jesus. We're having a spiritual affair on Jesus. When we say we're a believer, we go back to the sins of our old life. We are having a spiritual affair. And that's what James is talking about here in verse 4 and in 6 through 6 or in 5 when he says they are adulterous people. And he says that our sin is the same thing is as sneaking around behind our partner's back with our ex. He's equating those two things. If we can imagine the hurt and the pain that we would feel if our, if our husband or wife was cheating on them, this is what James equates that to in this passage. He's equating sin to an adulterous affair. But we see in verse 5 that he quotes Scripture and he says, is Scripture wrong when it says that God is jealous of us? David Platt says this about this verse. He says, God is jealous for the affections of your heart as a follower of Christ. This is not an insecure jealousy that is afraid you're going to find someone or something else that is better. This is a secure jealousy that seeks what is best for you by guarding your heart from adulterous pursuits. David Platt's statement there is saying that God isn't jealous of you because he's scared you're going to find something better. Because God knows there's nothing better than him. He's, this is a jealousy that is secure because he wants what's best for us. He knows that what we're doing is bad for us and that is wrong and that we shouldn't do it. And he's saying that if we would stay invested in our relationship with him, then we would not. Then we would, we would be doing what God intended for us. God wants relationship with us, but when we reject that, we turn back to the sins of our past. We turn back to our old life. We are in an adulterous affair with our old life, with our old way of living. Let's look at verses 6 through 10. We see a, we see a turn here in the text. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. We see here that there's a change in the tone, there's a change in the text. You see that word, but there, that but he gives more grace, that he gives grace to the humble. And it's because of that grace that he gives that James here is calling us to submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus. And when we do this, he says that the enemy will flee from us, that when we give over to give our desires over to God, then the temptations of the enemy will flee from us. And in doing so, we are called to live holy lives. And this happens when we practice repentance. It is in our, in our repentance, in our submission, that we are then exalted. It is humility that brings our exaltation. Despite our adultery, God gives more grace. If we were to look at Romans 5, verse 20, it says this, Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, Grace abounded all the more. Paul says where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul says it again very similarly in 2 Timothy 2, 13, where he says when we are faithless, he remains faithful. That when we are faithless, he remains faithful. This is why we submit. We submit to God because over and over and over again, when we turn back to our old life, God gives more grace. He gives more grace, and this is why we need to submit. It is Sam Alberry that says this about submission. The remedy to our pride and worldliness is to submit to God. By calling the worldly Christian to submit, Jesus, James, is calling them back into what the Christian life should always be marked for. 
Sam Albury is making the point that when we submit, that what we're actually doing is submitting ourselves to what God intended for us to be the whole entire time. That our life is intended to be spent in relationship with the Father. That our life is intended to be in relationship with the Son. That this is what God made us for. That this is why we were here. And when we draw near to Him, what we see is that then God draws nearer to us. And we also see that the closer we are to God, God, the further the enemy flees from us. That this is a connection that is being made. The closer we are to God, the farther the enemy will be. I want to give you this example. Imagine you had two dogs. Imagine you had two dogs, and one dog you fed a ribeye every single day. You gave him a big 12-ounce ribeye every single day of his life. And the other dog, you gave him your scraps. Let's say you gave him scraps every other day. Which dog would be stronger? The dog that you gave the ribeye to every day, right? The dog that you fed better, the dog that you took care of better. The dog that you take care of will be stronger and will have more chance of living than the dog that you don't feed. Here's what we need to understand. The thing that we feed in our life, the, the relationship that we feed in our life is more apt to stay alive, is more apt to thrive the more we feed it. We have to feed our relationship with Jesus and we need to starve the world. We do not need to give in to the relationship or the temptations that the enemy sets before us. We need to be feeding the, the, our relationship with Jesus. It is then we will see our life begin to change. We, have to, we think that we have to clean ourselves up first before we can go to God, that we have to get our life together. We've got to make sure that we're this type of person or that type of person. We have to be a, a good person in order to come to God. But this isn't how it works. God changes us from the inside out. He says that he cleanses us. Being a Christian is not behavioral modification. It is not about becoming a good person person on the outside. It's not about, about being good. In fact, it's about heart change. It's about changing from the inside out. It's about making a change. It's about God making that change inside of us that then it comes out of us. This is what we see Jesus calling us to in verse 9. If you look at verse 9, I'm going to read that one again. It says this, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned and mourning and your joy to gloom. When I first read this, I was baffled by this verse because God is calling me to weep. He's calling me to, to mourn. He's calling me to be, to be gloomful. What, what's he mean by that? What's, what's James getting at in verse 9? This is the way God wants us to see our sin. This is the way we should repent. That when we repent, that we should then see our sin and we should be weeping over it. That we should be grieving over our sin. That our sin should cause us to mourn because our sin is pulling us away from that relationship with the Lord. That our sin should be something that we mourn over. This is how we should sin. Our sin should cause us to mourn. This happens, this only happens when we then humble ourselves. When we submit ourselves to God. Life change, happen. life change happens with submission to the one who we were created to be with. Life change happens when we submit our lives to the one we were created to be with. Then we get to verses 11 through 17. In 11 through 17, before I read it, you need to understand this. He gives two different warnings. He gives two different warnings. And what we see is this. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver law and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but you who are to judge, who are you to judge your neighbor? Verse 13, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such, and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it, it, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. You, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do, for him it is sin. What we see very clearly here is that James gives two warnings. The first warning is this, is not to speak evil against your brothers, to not say bad things about them. And when we do, we then become judges, that we begin judging them. 
Then in verse 13, we see that he tells us not to, that we should not plan in such a way that does not consider the sovereignty of God. That we should, that when we plan, that we shouldn't plan so far in the future that we don't consider what God is doing for us, right? That we don't consider that he is in control. And we've said time and time again in this letter, we're going to continue in these next few weeks to say this, that the faith that saved us should be the faith that then informs the way that we live. And our relationship with Jesus should should be evident in what we say and what we do. This is what this is the same point that James is making here, but he's given two very specific examples. First, in what we say. Our words should not be tearing down other people, nor should we be judgmental of other people. They should not be doing that. And why? Because we've made this point in the last few weeks. We should not be judgmental of other people because we all have this in common, that we are image bearers of God and we are sin carriers, that every single person, Every single person is an image bearer of God. And so we should treat them as that. We should treat them as they are bearing the image of God. But we also need to understand that just like us, we are all broken by sin. And so we are carrying sin with us. That every single person is broken by sin. So who are we to judge our, the people that are around us? We all have these things in common. We especially should not judge those who are not believers. We cannot expect unbelievers to act like believers. We can't expect them to. We cannot hold them to a standard of living if they don't believe what we believe. It's a ridiculous thing to say to someone who doesn't believe what we believe, hey, you shouldn't act like that because they don't believe that. We cannot be judgmental of them in that way. We need to understand that if when we speak to someone who is an unbeliever, we need to speak to what uh, communicate the way we talked about last week with kindness, respect, and then of course the gospel. Not only in what we say, but also in what we do. We see very clearly here in 13 through 17 that he's addressing how we plan and how we plan our life. In fact, James equates our life to a mist. He says that our life is a mist and how quickly it goes away. Think about how misty our bathrooms are after a hot shower. And then how quickly when you open that door, that mist just disappears. This is what James equates our life to. That's something that just disappears quickly, like a mist. And if our life is that quick, why would we consult God about how we should live our life? Sam Alberry says this, James is not against planning. He is warning us against planning that does not acknowledge the Lord's sovereign, overreaching arm in our life. He's not against us having a calendar. He's not against us making plans for the future. In fact, we know that we can't live without planning our lives, that we can't plan day to day, week to week, month to month, and even year to year. We have to plan our lives out because of our jobs and everything. God is not against you planning. He's not against you having a schedule or a calendar. But he is against the attitude of us planning when we don't consider him in it. He's against that. He's, he's against the attitude of us of not considering him in our planning. In fact, it's Proverbs 16.9 that says this. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I don't think there's a better example of this verse than what we have experienced in the last six months. How many of us have made plans that have had to be canceled? How many of us have had trips that's had to be rescheduled or pushed back or just canceled altogether? How many of us expected for school to look like it does today when we, when we canceled back in March? How many of us expected to not have to have high school football in the fall, to have it in February and in spring? We didn't expect any of this. We did not expect a worldwide pandemic to impact us the way it did. But God did. He knew this was going to come. He knew this was going to happen. We cannot plan our lives around ourselves, but we have to plan our lives around him. We don't know what the future holds, but God does. God knows what the future holds. And what he ends all of this. He ends this section in verse 17 by saying this. So whatever, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. 
He anchors these two commands from 11 to 17 in this one verse in 17 that says, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, then you have committed the sin. What James is describing here is what we call the sin of omission. And there's st- we, have the, we, we all are familiar with the sin of commission. These are sins that we're told not to do when we do them and we commit something. We commit to sinning. For example, he, James has told us earlier that we are to not show favoritism to we are not to be partial. So when we do show favoritism, when we are partial to certain people, then we are committing that sin. We are committing the sin of partiality. But when James tells us, hey, take care of the poor, and we see someone who is needy or poor, and we do not take care of them, then we are omitting to take care of the poor, then we are committing the sin of omission. This book is full of right things to do. This book is full of practical wisdom that tells us how we should live our life. And if we do not practice that wisdom, then we are committing the sin of omission. James is calling us to to live a faith that live out the faith that saves us. And when we don't, we are being sinful because we are, we are living out the sin of omission. Then we get to chapter 5 in the first six verses. And what we see here is that James saves his harshest language for the rich. In verse five, chapter 5, verses 1. <clears throat> Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and you will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud. You are, are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. What we see here is that the strongest language here is reserved for the wealthy. And he addresses the fact that they have hoarded their wealth just to see that it waste away, not even be used. And that he, they have even taken advantage of them, those who are lower than them, of their workers, and not paid them the way they should be paid. That they have become defined by their own wealth, and they have self-indulged themselves to the point of being fat and overweight, and to be not just fat physically, but I think he says a fat in heart. That they've defined themselves by the way that they, that they have defined themselves by their wealth. James here is more than likely not addressing believers, but actually addressing non-believers. And he's doing this here in this passage because he doesn't want the believers that he's addressing to be jealous of those who are wealthy. He doesn't want them to become like them. He doesn't want them to see their wealth or to see money the way that the wealthy see money. See, James' problem isn't with the of, of having wealth or having money. That's not his problem. His problem is what we do with wealth and how we handle our money. In fact, it's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, that we see this. Do not lay for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. James here is using the same ideology that Jesus uses when it comes to our wealth. He's saying that our wealth does no good to store here on earth because it will waste away. That our wealth is meant to be used. Now listen, let's be clear. James is not saying it's, it's, not, it's wrong for us to save money, or wrong to put money in the bank. I don't think that's the point he's making. But it is wrong for us to hoard it. It is wrong for us to lord it over people. It is wrong for us to acquire it just for the sake of acquiring it. Wealth is meant to be used. Wealth is meant to be used to help others. And for the believer, wealth is used to be for the spread of the gospel. This is the way we need to see our wealth. And when we acquire it and we hoard over it and we don't allow it to be used, then we are making it something, we are giving it power that it's not meant to have. James, in this section, in this passage of Scripture, uses his sharpest language in the whole book. The sharp language is used to drive a single point, and that single point is this. 
that someone cannot serve two masters. James is making the point that someone cannot serve both God and the world. James, as he often does, has said a lot um, that sounds like his older half-brother Jesus. And he does it again here. It's in Matthew 6, 24, just a few verses down from what we just read, that he says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus here is very clear to say that we can't serve two masters. And if we do, we will hate one and love the other or despise one and love the other. And he even gives the example at the very end. He, Jesus gives the example of money. The reality is this, is that we cannot serve two masters. If we are to live out the faith that saved us, then we must submit to the God that saved us. We can't serve two masters. Well, what masters are we serving today? I think James outlines two that are still relevant, and we've already talked about these two, but the, the first one is this, is that we have a master in our schedule. Our schedules lord over us. What do we say when people ask us how we are doing? When we see somebody in passion, we say, hey man, how are you doing today? Our response, or at least I know my response is this, I'm good man, but I'm busy. Good but busy. It's a good day, but man, it's a busy day. We have equated busyness to success. We have equated to, to have a full schedule is to, be, is to live a successful life. We run to this event and to that event, but to what end? We put our kids in this, in this program or in that athletic team, and, but to what end? At what purpose are we doing this? We run our lives to this committee in the community or this committee in the church or we're a part of all these different things, but to what end? To say that our life is busy? Why are we doing all the things that we're doing? Now listen to me. There is a lot of good things that we should be a part of. Our kids, I believe, should be a part of as many extracurriculars as they, as they, can, as they can handle. I, I grew up in athletics. I love coaching. I don't think there's anything wrong with travel ball. I don't think there's anything wrong with those things. I don't think there's anything wrong with music or dance, whatever your kid wants to be a part of. Those things play an integral role in shaping their life. I don't think there's a better way to disciple young men or women than it is through coaching or through athletics or any other extracurricular. I think they're good things, but good things can become bad gods. We can make them lords over our life. And there's nothing wrong with serving in our community and serving in committees and different things like that. And believe me, as your pastor, there's nothing wrong with you serving here. We want you to serve here. But the reality is, is this. We can allow committees and things in a busy schedule to become lord over our life. Our busy lives can be good until we lose sight of who we are serving and why we are serving if we lose sight of why we're on the stewardship committee or why we're on properties or any other committee here, we lose sight of why we're doing that. If we're not doing that with the gospel in mind, then we have created a master. We have created a God out of church, and that's not what it was intended to be. If we spend every single weekend playing baseball, softball, or basketball, and we don't ever recognize that this is ruling and reigning over our lives, then what we have done is created an idol out of ball. And what we have to understand is that those things are good, but they make terrible gods. Our schedule can rule over us and become our master. Not only our schedule, but what we, James also points out is our wealth. He points out our wealth. That if we see, and Jesus also points this out, that we cannot serve two masters. And the example that Jesus gives is money. That we cannot serve God and money. Money is important. We can't live without it. We have to have money. We have to have it. But a lot of times what we do is we equate money with comfort. That we find our comfort in how much money we have in the bank and how much money and that we have to be comfortable. We have to not only have money, but we have to have money to have all these other things and possessions. When we allow money to equal comfort in our lives, we are giving it value that it was never meant to have. We are allowing it to become master over us. We are allowing it to become Lord it's in Romans 1, 22 to 25, that we see this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal gods for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged 
the truth about God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul is making the point in Romans 1 that when we begin worshiping our schedule or our wealth or any other thing here that is of this world, then what we're doing is we're making a trade. That we are trading. We're making trades and exchanges that we are exchanging something that is immortal, God, for something that is mortal, man, creation. He even says that we trade the creator for the creation. That we are making exchange, that we are trading the goodness of God for the goodness of the things that he created. That we are valuing the things that he created over himself. Why would we want to do that? Why would we make these trades? These trades are foolish trades. I want you to think about in the Old Testament the story of Jacob and Esau and that. Esau came back from a hunting trip and he was so hungry. He was so hungry. He was so hungry, in fact, that, that Jacob was making, was making red lentil stew, and he said, I'm so hungry, will you please give me some stew? And Jacob looked at Esau, taking advantage of him, and said, I'll give you some stew if you give me your birthright, if you give me your inheritance, if you give me everything that our Father is going to give you to set you up for life, if you give me all of that, I'll give you some stew. And Esau takes it. He trades his birthright for a bowl of red lentil stew. What a foolish trade. What, a, what, what, an, what an idiotic trade he made. But here's what we need to understand. When we trade the things of this world for God, we are making the same foolish trade. We're making the same trade. Why we want to do this? What has this world offered us that makes this seem so appealing? What we need to understand is that the world only takes from us. It never truly gives to us schedule, money, technology, or anything else of this earth make terrible gods. They only take things away from us. They never give anything to us. None of, none of these things, none of the things of this world have ever died for you. Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer because Jesus died for you. Jesus did something that this world will never do or they can, it can't ever do. Jesus was perfect. The, the things of this world do not have the ability to be perfect. In fact, they called you to be less perfect. Jesus was perfect and he was perfect in your place, taking your punishment, taking your death, and in doing so, giving you life. When the world takes, Jesus gives. You see, the things of this world decay and die. Jesus conquered decay. He conquered death. And Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer. So why would we want anything else other than him? Why do we want anything else other than him? The world is decaying and dying all around us, but what Jesus gives us is life and life eternal. So why do we want anything else? So here's the question. What do we do now? How do we turn back from our worldly lives back to a life that is marked by submission to God? We do what James has instructed us to do. The first thing we do is we repent. We turn our life around. We are going in one direction, and we make a turn and go in the direct opposite direction. The second thing we do is that we must submit our life that our life must be marked by submission, that what the Word of God says that we must then do. James tells us that we must not just be hearers, but we must also be doers. And then James also commands us in this passage to draw near to Him, that we are called to draw near to Him, that we are called to be in relationship with Him, that we are called to repurpose our life in a way that draws us near to Him. In conclusion, I'll say this. We cannot live out the faith that saved us if we, if we are trying to follow two masters. We cannot live out the faith that saved us if we have two masters. If we are to be who God has called us to be, then we must submit to one master. We must submit to God. And why will we submit to anyone else? What other thing or what other person has done what God has done for you? They haven't and they won't. Mortar says this, God is tirelessly on your side. He never falters in respect to our needs. He always has more grace at hand 
for us. He is never less than sufficient. He always has more and yet more to give. Whatever we may forfeit when we put self first, we cannot forfeit our salvation. For there is always more grace. There is always more grace. Where sin aboundeth, grace aboundeth all the more. Why would we not submit to that? Why would we not call him Lord? He is a good, good father who loves you and wants what's best for you. He's calling us to submit, church submit let's pray lord you are good to us and lord you take such good care of us and lord in time and time again we 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 turn our backs on you and we turn to the world and lord we pray and we ask for forgiveness and lord i pray that right now that we would repent i pray that we would that we would live different lives because of your word because of what james has told us here in chapter four and chapter five that we would live differently lord you have been so good to us and lord i pray that today i pray that today that we would live different lives because of your word, that we would live a life that was marked by submission and that because of that lord because of the grace that you've shown us that we would submit our lives to you and we would do what you say we would do what you say that the faith that you have given us, that saved us, Lord, that we would live that faith out in what we say and what we do. Lord, help us to do that this week as we go back to school, and as we go back to our workplaces, and as we just do life this week. Help us to live out the faith that saved us. Lord, it's in your name that we pray, and in all glory belongs to you. Amen. What a wonderful service today, beginning with let our light shine. And, you know, we can't let our light shine without Jesus in us. So we can't do it on our own. We can't control our tongues. We can't pull ourselves out of this world. Only Jesus and the amount of light that he has in us can do so. So now as I pray this benediction over you, let us pray. Lord, I ask for all of us that may the God of peace himself sanctify us all completely. Lord, may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because he who calls us is faithful and he will surely do it. Amen.